Today we're going to learn how to look at a work of art and we're going to be using um, two North American peoples, uh, the ancient people of the Anasazi and a more contemporary people called the Navajo to do this. And my intention for this lesson is to more or less teach you how to look at a work of art as an artifact and to analyze it according to three planes of, anal uh, of analysis. The first plane of analysis is the physical or formal plane, and um, you would basically describe how it looks and how it feels. The second plane of analysis that you would talk about is the content or symbols that are being used. And then the third plane of analysis would be the background or context or history behind the work of art. In terms of this work of art, we're just going to divorce it from what it represents and the people that made it, and we're going to look at it purely in terms of its physical characteristics, which are the formal characteristics. So in this instance, we're going to do a formal analysis. In terms of formal analysis, you have to know what the basis of a formal analysis is, which is the medium, which is what the work is made out of, the shapes that describe the forms in the work of art. The lines, and lines can have different kinds of qualities. For instance, they can be thick or thin. They can be long or short. The colors that are being used, and if you uh, know your color wheel, there are three levels of color, primary colors, which are um, red, blue, and yellow, and then secondary colors, purple, green and orange and then a third level of color which is the tertiary level which are browns also the physical texture of the work of art is important um, and we can also talk about visual texture for instance uh, is it choppy um, is it smooth in terms of how it looks but also is it rough or smooth in terms of how it feels and then the last plane would be composition so looking at this work of art We'll start first with an analysis of its physical medium. The medium that's used for this work of art is basically something called fresco. Um, I don't think that this is true fresco, which means that uh, in true fresco, what you would do is you would take uh, plaster or some kind of lime and you would uh, grind it up you would apply it to the wall as a sort of mud and you would also add chalk dust and paint directly on it while it was still damp and that's called true fresco or buon fresco spelled b-u-o-n this instance i think it was fresco secco s-e-c-c-o which means dry fresco and the materials that were used are basically lime and plaster and chalk and mud and then the pigments which are the colors that were used are more most likely iron ores naturally occurring reds and soils uh, also possibly some berries uh, or pollens naturally occurring substances in the landscape that they would mix with water and then apply to the wall and use various substances to get it to stick i think in this instance it's probably water uh, mixed with with those substances so the medium is fresco. Now in terms of shape, um, the way that you can describe shapes are you can say it's natural looking shapes, um, you can say that it's unnatural looking shapes, but in this instance you would say that the shapes are geometric. They're almost looking like rectangles, spheres, cones, and all of the forms are outlined, so the shapes are defined by lines. In this instance, it seems like the lines are pretty consistent. They're, they don't vary a lot in terms of thickness. Um, they're all fairly thin lines that describe the boundaries of each of the forms. Sometimes some short lines are used, but never to create texture. So lines here are just used to define the boundaries of form. There is no light and shadow in this piece. It's a flat diagram. There's no shading. Uh, there's no indication of uh, where the light is coming from or light source. So in terms of this, you just have to look at it uh, as a flat, diagrammatic, almost cartoon-like work of art. And I bet it's meant to be like that. It's meant to just clearly communicate what it is just by not using light and shadow. It's not meant to dazzle you with its uh, illusion. 
the colors that are being used are, could be described as earth colors. There are no primary colors, no reds, blues, or yellows. You could kind of describe the colors as being um, oranges, but primarily the colors are earth tone, which means that they are browns. There's not a lot of texture. Uh, you'll have to take my word for this. The, the texture uh, across the wall is smooth, and visually there's not a lot of texture. There's not a lot of variation in what happens as you move across the picture from left to right. But you can also analyze the work of art in terms of its composition. And composition is kind of a tough term for a lot of students. They have a hard time understanding what composition is. And so I've provided some definitions of composition for you and some diagrams here on the screen. The composition with the light yellowish green in the upper left hand corner of those four diagrams, you would actually describe that as asymmetrical. Uh, an asymmetrical composition is something in which the visual weight, there's more stuff on the left hand side than there is on the right hand side. And um, the upper right hand corner diagram, uh, this, this one with the white background and two spheres on the right hand side and one large sphere on the left hand side, is still fairly asymmetrical and if you compare those two diagrams, you might say that the one on the left seems to be more visually pleasing and more balanced than the one on the right. The two bottom diagrams, the one with the white background uh, and has a two spheres and, uh, and a square, uh, and the one that has three uh, squares with the rectangle in the center, it's got two squares on either side of it, you would describe that as symmetrical. Uh, the reason why you can describe it as symmetrical is you can cut that thing in half and it'll be equal on a dividing line. We also refer to that as bilateral symmetry. Bilaterally symmetrical just basically means sim means the same metros as measure, so it's the same measurement on either side of a dividing line. In this case, you would describe the composition as being symmetrical. Now there is one other kind of symmetry that we're going to come across later on in lecture, and that's called radial symmetry. Radial symmetry is when you take a center point, almost like a wheel, and you have stuff radiating from the center of it, and it's equal. For instance, this is a blanket and it's radially symmetrical. Now in terms of the picture plane, there isn't a lot of space being created by uh, any kind of overlapping. If you look at this diagram, you'll see that the diagram indicates that there's a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, and it's almost like you're sticking your face against a window. And the window that you're pressing your face against, you are at the front of the picture plane, and if you were looking into a restaurant, the people seated closest to the window would be in the foreground, people seated further back in the restaurant would be in the middle ground, and then the waiter coming in from the kitchen would be in the far background. In this painting that we're looking at, there is only a foreground. There's no creation of space, and one of the ways that you would create space is to make the shape smaller as you move away, uh, to change the size and scale. So when you look at this work of art, it's primarily flat, doesn't have a lot of depth, doesn't have a lot of shading. It's a diagrammatic piece, which means it just describes the forms. And you can go further in describing the forms because you recognize the forms. They're, they're cartoons of things. For instance, there's birds. There's a figure of a man who has a hat on that has feathers in the hat. He's carrying kind of a spear or a staff. There are fish uh, pictures, there are more birds, there's a pot, and it almost looks like the bird is dropping uh, seeds out of its mouth. There's something that looks kind of like water, but we're really not sure what that is. And that brings us to the next plane of analysis, which happens to be the plane of analysis that deals with symbols or the content, which is called iconography. Iconography. Iconography is a weird word. Um, probably the easiest way to understand it is to think of the fact that you have icons on your desktop when you're working with your computer. And that icon is a symbol of a computer program that opens up and gives you a whole world of images and ideas and things like that. Uh, another term for icon is, uh, for instance, in popular culture, um, 
Marilyn Monroe was an icon of female sexuality. Batman is an icon, icon of uh, masculinity, that kind of thing. The, uh, so icon is basically a symbol. And graphos, or graphy, means to write. And so when we study iconography, it's basically this, the study of the subject matter and the symbols used in the painting uh, or in the work of art, sculpture, even what a building can, can stand for. So we have to take a look at some of the icons or symbols that would be used in this work of art. And so for instance, feathers are used uh, in this work of art. And um, now when I, we're interpreting the iconography of this Anasazi work of art according to uh, a more contemporary people who have explained what they think it means could mean something different. It's all, you know, a guessing game, but feathers can sometimes represent prayers, marks of honor, sources of ideas. Um, they can represent the creative force. Um, I always think of a cheesy song, Fly Like an Eagle. Um, you know, it, it can create, uh, you know, a sense that you're above it all and feathers are a symbol of power. Sometimes when you put feathers together and uh, you make a sort of headdress or even a, a spear with feathers on them um, and you attach those, you're kind of combining the powers. And so a prayer stick or a pajos uh, is a cottonwood or a cedar stick with feathers attached to it. Um, and sometimes they are basically almost like leaving uh, an offering at an altar for Christians or for Buddhists, for other religions, uh, you know, like burning incense, a feather can represent lifting up and going up to the sky. There are a series of um, little creatures that are intermediary creatures that you could probably think of them a little bit as almost being like um, angels. Uh, in some instances, I suppose they could be, um, they could be demons. And these uh, go-between spirits uh, are called yay spirits. They're not gods. They're not creators. Uh, they are messengers like angels. So we can see a symbol of that. Now, you take that, you put it all together, and you look at this work of art, and you can see that there are feathers being used in the headdress, which is an honorific symbol, which also means that they are lifted up. You've got birds being represented here, um, and the birds that are represented um, are actually dropping seeds. So maybe those birds represent some kind of spirit that is dropping seeds and providing things. This guy's wearing, you know, wearing a headdress. He has a stick in his hand with feathers on it. And if you look in his right hand, which is our left hand side, what you'd also see is that he is carrying what's called a yay spirit. Um, so an interpretation of this might be that this is a powerful guy because he's got a stick that has feathers on it. He's wearing uh, what could be equated to be a crown, and he is actually controlling or holding a spirit in his right hand, uh, and that could represent possibly, we don't know for certain, that he has control over some kind of supernatural forces. Um, and we also see on the right hand side of the image that, that there's a pot uh, with, um, with seeds or water uh, flowing through it, near it. Um, there's a bird-like form. There's even arrows and things. So we don't really know what all these symbols mean, but we could extrapolate from knowing the later symbols from the Navajo culture that this is a powerful um, priest. Uh, sometimes referred to as a shaman or a shaman, I've heard it pronounced. And he is controlling the spirit world. Uh, and the spirit world, in his control of it, he is able to ask the uh, creator spirits, for instance, maybe that's a thunderbird or an eagle, uh, to help him with some kind of fertility or with some kind of growth. Which means that the next thing or the next plane of analysis we need to look at really is context. Like, for instance, where does this work of art fit in with the rest of the culture? How does it fit in with the context of the Anasazi people? And even uh, contextual analysis might include uh, analyzing the Anasazi people in reference to the Navajo people that came after them, the interrelated conditions, the environment that they lived in, the setting of their buildings, the setting of the works of art. So that's called a contextual analysis. And I really like the... Uh, the Latin for this, because 
con means against and text is something that you read. So what we're doing is we're weaving together texts. And so we're weaving together the environment, we're weaving together our interpretation of it, and we're weaving together what other people's interpretation of it to do a contextual analysis, which is a historical, cultural, and environmental analysis of a work of art. So contextualism in terms of art history is kind of an interesting thing because it's really in some ways a little bit more um, fact-based in a little way uh, where you actually have to know some facts about surrounding cultures and about the, the area that this thing comes from. I think that iconography is actually the most shaky form of, of analysis because in iconography you are interpreting symbols but in terms of formal analysis you're doing a straight description and in terms of contextual analysis you're actually looking at the facts that surround it. So let's take a look first at the geography. The geography of the Anasazi people is that they lived in the southwestern United States and the culture of the Anasazi um, probably the dates were it between 550 to 1400 common era. We know that the Anasazi is not what they call themselves. The Anasazi um, is actually a term that was given to the, by the Navajo people, who, which means ancient people who are not us or the enemy ancestors. Um, there's an art historian named Ernst Gombrich who described the analysis of symbols and uh, the development of art over time as being something that happens uh, as, so, as a sort of Darwinian evolution. He called that schema and correction. Schema and correction is basically the Anasazi people were the schema. They were the beginning culture and the Navajo and even the Hopi and some other southwestern cultures um, took what they learned from the Navajo and changed it or corrected it or updated it according to what they needed to understand. And when we study dates, when we, we'll, we won't be using BC and AD, uh, and you might have grown up with that. What we're going to do is refer to anything before the Common Era, which means before the birth of the historical figure of Jesus as BCE, before the Common Era. And instead of Anno Domini, or some people call it after death, we're going to refer to anything after the birth of the historical figure of Jesus as the Common Era, because it's a common dating system. So in this instance, they lived in the southwestern United States between 550 and 1400 in the Common Era. And the environment they lived in was actually kind of a rough environment. And uh, there's some evidence that maybe they didn't live in some of these sites. For instance, uh, um, some of the sites that might have just been primarily religious sites. And we understand that they might not have been actually uh, functioning sites as a, as a settlement because of the amount of trash, believe it or not, that's found behind in their trash heaps doesn't match how large the complex is and there wasn't a lot of organic waste. We know that there was very little water. We know that it's a dry climate. Uh, we also know that during the day it's enormously hot. It's, it gets up to hundreds of degrees. It's very dry, very arid. Um, and at night it actually gets super, super cold. So they needed to protect themselves from this environment. So for instance, they would provide a place for themselves that was shielded from the environment, but also probably shielded from people who might attack them. So they would have cliff dwellings. For instance, the Keat Seal ruins in the Navajo National Mo Monument um, are actually a site that's built into a cliff wall and you'd have to climb a ladder to get to it. You'd have, it would be very hard to get to these ruins. And so even though there were rock cut steps in the sides of some of these places, if you were trying to come down and steal the resources of another people, if you were, for instance, a, a marauding nomad and you wanted to attack this site, it would be really tough for you to do that because what you'd have to do is you'd have to climb down and they could head you off at the pass and literally push you off. And then to get into the building, sometimes you even needed ladders. So they're built in places that would be very protective. Uh, some places that would be very protective. Uh, some people actually think that, um, you know, they were also kind of spiritual sites in a way, but um, there's one site in particular called Pueblo Bonito, and we're looking at that, and it was not built into a cliff face. 
And there's some evidence uh, that that site might have actually been primarily a religious city that didn't have year-round residents. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in depth later. So the context of Pueblo Bonito that we're going to be looking at is it's a big sort of almost D-shaped complex. It has a lot of big tall walls. It seems to actually have been built across um, or according to uh, the celestial bodies and there's actually a petroglyph. Petro uh, means uh, stone, glyph means carving or mark on a place called Vajara Butte that looks like a map or a diagram of the Pueblo Bonito. And it seems to indicate that the, um, the sun and the summer solstice are hitting the site and creating actually almost a shadow map of the site itself. And that the site was built to reference the movements of the sun and the morning star and um, and the moon actually in some ways. And so there's a kind of cool video about this, um, which I have on reserve uh, in the library and you can take a look at that. I'll also show it in class. So the ground plane of Pueblo Bonito uh, shows that the walls are located or oriented in such a way that they would actually be uh, um, a way of indicating um, how the movements of the sun uh, and the stars move and the moon and therefore would be almost like a giant clock or a, a giant calendar. Some of the evidence suggesting the masonry uh, of the site, if you take a close look at the site, um, that these are big walls that that have these large interior spaces in them, but the spaces can't be used because if you build a fire inside these spaces, um, the smoke, there's not enough ventilation and the smoke would actually kill you and it would eat up all of the oxygen. So the Anasazi site of the Pueblo Bonito um, might have been primarily a religious site that was not meant to house people because they didn't find enough trash behind it. And uh, the inter interior spaces uh, don't seem actually uh, livable. And then the addition of looking at a series of what's called kiva structures. And these kiva structures are round temples that are kind of almost like a sweat lodge. They're, they're dug into the earth and what you would be able to do with this site is you would um, climb in through a hole in the roof and there are frescoes or paintings on the walls of them. In this instance uh, a lot of the kivas are not intact and uh, the reason why a lot of the kivas are not intact is not that it was abandoned and they fell apart, but there seems to be an indication that when they left the site, they actually burnt it all at one point in time. The roofs of the kivas are sort of an overlapping, almost igloo-like pattern of large logs. Now, that's also an indication that this might have been a religious site because the lumber is not accessible there. They would have had to carry lumber in from quite a long distance away and actually use the lumber and construct the site. So these Anasazi people, who knows who they really were, but you could extrapolate and sort of fantasize that they were the enemy ancestors of the Navajo that, that built a religious site um, that was in the middle of the southwestern United States in a very hostile environment and that they lived there for a long period of time, um, that there was a priest class that lived there and that they visited it sort of almost the way some people visit Mecca or visit uh, church sites. They, it was a religious site and that the people who lived there were a priestly class or a religious class. So when we look at the, the kivas, they sort of flesh that out a little bit. And now if you look at the kivas um, sort of in a more spiritual or Freudian or symbolic way and you relate it to other things, think of the kiva as a church. The kiva is just this uh, church that is dug into the ground and you're in Mother Earth, literally, and on the walls are a series of paintings. And these paintings on the walls could represent stories that relate to their religion. And I want you to think about a church, for instance. When you walk into a church, sometimes what you might imagine when you're looking in a church is um, that it's a 
site that magnifies religious or magical power. Then if you look at the walls of the church, there's actually pictures on the walls and sculptures on the walls of the church that tell the story um, of whoever the God is that you're worshiping. So for instance, for Christians, you would look on the walls and you would see stories that relate to the New Testament and tell the story of the life and times of the historical figure of Jesus. Um, and then you're able to tell the story to other people using those pictures as a mnemonic device. They remind you of what's going on. So for instance, in the Kiva, um, in uh, Pueblo Bonito, you would find the fresco that we were just looking at. And this fresco then might represent a religious story because of its location, its context gives us a little bit more about that. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at is actually the patterns that we understand. Um, now, these patterns seem to be used over and over again by later cultures and by the Navajo uh, by the Hopi. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the interpretation again of these patterns. And then we're going to apply these patterns and the interpretation of these patterns to the Anasazi pots. So for instance, the border patterns on there are, uh, according to the Navajo people, we, um, would be reoccurring spirals and whirls that are connected to the cycle of life. Um, we call this sort of step pattern, the Greek key, because we have seen it in Greek art, which is interesting that it seems to be in other cultures. Sometimes you'll see spirals in them, and spirals come up as whirlwinds. Uh, you see spirals in water, uh, and a spiral is also a pattern that renews itself in a way. It's eternal. Another border pattern uh, that looks like steps could represent uh, the steps of a kiva, According to the Navajo, um, they could look a little bit like jagged clouds moving across the horizon. And then, of course, there's another uh, border pattern that looks like waves, spirals. And again, that could be life and renewal. So let's take a look at um, an Anasazi pot, this seed jar. Um, and it's called a seed jar because it's a jar that would have uh, been used to hold on to seeds. And uh, one of the most important things in the Navajo culture would have been to, uh, or the Anasazi culture would have been to preserve um, foodstuffs from rodents. Uh, wherever you have civilization, you have the devil's lapdog, which are rats and rodents. And so you wanna protect the food by putting it inside a masonry jar that the rats can't uh, get through, the rats and the mice. And it's interesting because if we look at this Anasazi jar, and you look at it in terms of what it looks like and the, the patterns on it, you could almost say that the patterns on it represent a couple of things that protect the jar as well as represent some kind of spiritual things. Now they could also just be decoration for decoration's sake, but let's talk about it from what's called an apotropaic or protective function first. First of all, there's a lizard on top of the, uh, the jar. And that lizard is fairly naturalistic, meaning it's not stylized. It doesn't, it doesn't look geometric. It's not stylized in, a, in any way where it's based on geometric forms. But if you look at the lizard in the bottom register of the jar, you can actually see that there is a lizard that is stylized. It's a cartoon of a lizard. Now, possibly lizards eat rodents. Um, geckos attack rodents and things like that. So it's possible that maybe this the putting the lizard on there is not just decorative, but meant to be <laughs> to scare off rodents or meant as a sort of protective or a good luck symbol. Now you have to think that these people were as smart as us and, and they know that rats are gonna see that and probably not think it's a real lizard. So it might've just been for entertainment's sake as well. The uh, other designs that we see on here uh, are these steps that look kind of like Kiva steps. And it's very possible that the Kiva steps represented uh, you know, you're, you're putting like, for instance, on the side of a coffee mug and you have a, the skyline of, a, of an important city that you visited. And it might have just been that simple as a decoration for that kind of thing. So when we look at the other two pots, we see some of the other symbols that we discussed, the border patterns that have spirals and waves, which might represent renewal, which might represent water. We have the Kiva steps. Um, they could also just be simple 
geometric designs that don't mean anything, which is an interesting idea. And we'll return to that idea in the next lecture.